It's New Bounty Day. One Piece is the only series in probably the history of all of media that can have such hype chapters by doing nothing but showing a bunch of numbers. And there's actually a whole ton of surprises when it comes to said numbers and a lot of hidden meanings that you may not necessarily have picked up on. But first, I love the way we open with Luffy in a cage with the Oda introduction text, citing this as Emperor Straw Hat Luffy. It's quite perfect because it does seem like a bit of a fun gag at first, but as he usually does, Oda actually ties this into a chapter motif. Because as we go on, we find another Emperor Buggy in a similar situation, also having been caught and berated by his quote unquote subordinates. And in general, I just love that Oda isn't as precious about these titles as a huge part of the online fan base can be. A lot of this chapter is highly compressed information. And as part of that, Oda made sure to showcase Jinbei as much as possible in the opening, which is something I really needed. This is his first time sailing properly aboard the Sunny with the crew and this period of casual bliss, look, it's not gonna last very long. So we need to make the most of it, and I really enjoy Jinbei's brief interactions, especially the hearty laugh moment, ho ho ho, which evokes a very strong sense of Roger's he laughed. I look at the panel and Jinbei has some serious Joy Boy vibes happening. And also in honor of Jinbei's arrival, Frankie mimicked his top knot hairstyle. Although to be fair, that could also be a nod to Wano. Sort of like when your friend goes on a holiday to the Caribbean and comes back with braids that, you know, absolutely do not suit them. But out of politeness, you just need to go, yeah, he, he looks great. There was also a great Nami gag with her using Conqueror's Haki, complete with the black lightning effect and everything. And it's actually perfect because Jinbei being taken aback by the joke Haki really solidifies his place in the crew. Which to be clear, that place is every weeb's dream because it is under Nami. Because the Straw Hats actually have two captains. Luffy is the captain on land. He decides what they do, how they do it, and which land they be heading to next. But Nami is the captain at sea. Because if they make one mistake in the new world, then they're all dead. And that's why Nami gets to punish Luffy because he usurped her authority at sea. And now he's in a cage where, sometimes rightfully, he belongs. But first, I'm wearing a jacket now. But also, a question. Have you ever wanted to dress your dog up like some sort of maniacal flamingo and turn him into a Scottish Lord? Because I have. As did the sponsor of this video, Established Titles. A project based on a historic Scottish custom whereby landowners are referred to as lairds, lords, or ladies in English. And you can officially change your name to lord or lady on stuff like credit cards. It's amazing. And I use this power to have Don Quixote Quixote Dog Flamingo officially declared as a lord. It's all right here on this shockingly official proclamation. Title packs give you at least one square foot of dedicated land with a unique plot number so that you could even go and visit your estate if you so desired. It's a great last minute gift for loved ones or even just semi liked ones. Also, I've been told that everyone who uses my link will get a plot next to each other. So we could even build our own like little Scottish Grand Line Empire. Plus established titles plants a tree with every order. And if you use code Grand Line, then you'll get an additional 10% off. So you can go to a EstablishedTitles.com slash Grand Line to get your gifts now and ascend into your lordyhood. But now it's back to you. Me? But this is Jinbei's first experience of crew submission. Before he was an official member, he was more of an ally of Nami, a colleague, if you will. However, he is now clearly under her command and that burst of joke hockey has sealed the deal with this whole dynamic. You know what? He still has not had the crew toast yet though. That's the one thing I'm still really missing with Jinbei. So maybe we'll get a handful of chapters doing all of the big world stuff and then come back to the Straw Hats, do a bit of a celebration and then bam, onto the next island. Or not, I don't know. I also want to point out one brilliant gem of a panel where Oda crammed in as much characterization as possible. Within this chaotic scene, you can see so many core character quirks at play, including angry Nami sleeping Zoro, Brooke smashing into a wall, Frankie dancing, and even Chopper doing his reverse hiding. And it's such an effective way of saying that everything's back to normal now. We're done with our special Wano adventure and this is classic One Piece again. Oh, and also we have a special announcement because as of August, 2022 AD, we have a bingo. With the revelation of the Straw Hat bounties, we have completed one whole row of our Grand Line Review 2022 Bing card. And we're gonna keep playing to see if we can pick up a few more before the year ends, but congratulations. To anyone who doesn't know, these events were not chosen by me. They were all actually provided by you guys, the Grand Fleet. And you've all done a phenomenal predictive job thus far. But getting into the meat of this shepherd's pie of a chapter, we have numbers, big numbers, one small number, but mostly big. And Oda revealed these bounties in, I guess, an interesting 
interesting way. One that I both liked and disliked at the same time, because there are just so many straw hats that obviously it becomes very difficult to like cram 10 full posters and reactions into a chapter. So Oda made the choice to omit most of the actual posters, which makes me kind of sad because I'm a very tangible person and I want to see them. Even if most of their pictures haven't changed, like say Nami's and Robin's, we saw those and they were both the same. But at the same time, it was also nice to have a fresh take on bounty revelations. Commencing with Chop, but our cotton candy lover has definitely increased and by comparatively a significant amount, but he is still worth a mere 1,000 berries. So it continues the gag of Chopper being thought of as the groupette. And to be fair, 1,000 berries, that's a lot because that means that Chopper is now worth exactly two Beppos. I am a bit surprised though because Chopper had a very public showing against Queen on the performance floor. So it's becoming a little bit harder to believe that no one has noticed this immense Tanuki threat. I love that Chopper, despite how timid and scared he is, he still wants to be thought of as like a raw big scary pirate man. We take an absolutely massive leap here though, starting with Nami, who now has a bounty of a whopping 366 million berries. To put that into some perspective, that is higher than Luffy after any slobby. Oh, and also here is a whole list of people that Nami now outworths. Mad Monka Rouge, Killer, Basil Hawkins, Diaz Drake, Jewelry Bonnie, Capone Gang Beige, and Scratch Manapu. So Nami is now worth more than the majority of the worst generation. That's, that's pretty wow. Is it deserved? Absolutely, because without her, as stated previously, all of the straw hats would just die immediately. But that's not the in-world reason as to why she's worth so much. Because most of the straw hats have simply had a bit of a commander fee slapped on top of their existing bounties. That fee is 300,000 berries, which they've earned just via being considered a commander of Luffy's crew. And the same is true of Brooke, who now clocks in at 383 million berries. Very fitting. I think that Brooke has been overlooked for far, far too long. I mean, yeah, he's not the greatest at the punch fighting because he, he lacks the muscle, but he's always an MVP. I also loved his reaction, which is just him vibing and having the time of his life as always. The dude Dude is just happy to be sailing and playing music, another one of our crew's spiritual joy boys. Frankie is a bit of a fascinating one because yeah, he got the standard commander's fee and ended up at 394 million, but his poster is actually of the Thousand Sunny, which at first seems like just a continuation of his bounty gag, but then it actually made me go, hey, wait, wait a second. Because to be honest, it, it, it's a gag, but it's not actually that funny. Frankie Shogun, that was funny, but Sunny is just, it's just kind of weird. And it makes me wonder if this is setting up a potential future plan plot point. Think about it this way. Frankie is currently the only straw hat whose face isn't published globally. So if the straw hats ever found themselves in a situation where they need someone to do some, you know, some stealthy stuff, Frankie rather hilariously is the only option. The loudest member of the crew completely incapable of subtlety would be the last resort because he's the only one of them who is not immediately recognizable. But also I suppose this actually makes the Thousand Sunny itself a potential target. If I was a bounty hunter, then essentially I'm being offered almost 400 million berries just to steal a ship. So maybe there's a point in the near future where this results in Sunny being taken or someone attempting to take Sunny. I don't know, I might just be being paranoid because post any slobby with Sanji taught me not to accept gag bounties as just gags, but using Sunny, I just, I don't know, it feels like it's setting something up. One of the big winners and or losers, depending on your perspective here, is Usopp, who is now worth half a billion berries. That's that's a lot. That's more than Edward Weevil was worth pre-bounty freeze. And it makes me really keen to see Yasop's reaction. He doesn't actually know his son, like, at all. So I imagine that Yasop thinks Usopp is becoming some sort of big, world-class, badass pirate man. And then when they actually meet, he'll be incredibly confused. There's not a whole lot more to say about Usopp. Again, he was just hit with a standard 300k commander's fee. But from here though, from here, the bounties just get absolutely wild. Nico Robin is now worth a very big number and that big number is 930 million berries, which I'm very glad about because I've been saying for years that she should be worth at least 1 billion. If only because the knowledge that she has is the greatest threat to the world government that this planet has to offer. And it seems like they finally relented and recognized that because Luffy is now exactly one red cube away from forming his pirate kingdom. Robin also has my favorite reaction of the chapter. Despite the staggering amount on her head and the trouble that this is inevitably going to cause, she does not care at all because Robin knows that she is 100% safe with the crew. She could have a 10 billion berry bounty on her head and still not feel threatened. It's one of those times that makes me really nostalgic for any slobby because you can see the growth that occurred because of that arc. However, the whatever below bronze medal is goes to Sanji and it's a pretty crazy number. 1 billion and 32 million berries, which under any other circumstance would be cause for celebration. But in terms of numbers, Sanji has been seriously bumped down. Not only below Zoro, but also below 
Jinbei. Speaking of, Jinbei's bounty is the most shocking to me. I definitely never expected it to reach over a billion. However, in comparison to the other warlord bounties in this chapter, I do think it remains consistent. Remembering that Jinbei is a bit of an established big shot in the whole One Piece. He's a former warlord, he was the captain of the Sun Pirates, and he's an associate of Big Mom and Whitebeard. To put it one way, his threat branding is more on point than Zoro or Sanji. And I love that it continues the one-sided beef between Sanji and Jinbei that started during the raid. I suppose we do now need to ask ourselves the big question, is this still the monster trio without Sanji, or are we going to expand into a monster quartet? I'm not really bothered either way, because in the long run, being a Zoro fan always pays off. And in this case, it has paid us 1 billion, 100 million, 1,100 berries, which seems like a random number, but this is actually a birthday bounty. Zoro was born on the 11th of November, or 11-11, hence why there are four ones in the bounty. And the same applies to Sanji, by the way. The 32 million in his bounty is likely a reference to his birthday on the 2nd of March, which according to the American system would be 3-2. Not the sane system, which would be 2-3. And you can tell that Bran you really put in a lot of effort in this case. I mean, mm, he sculpted Zoro's bounty to perfection, even going so far as to look up his birthday. I'm starting to think that Bran you is secretly a bit of a Zoro fan. Fun fact, Zoro was now worth more than Charlotte Kardakuri, as is Jinbei actually, which is pretty awesome because it's great to see Luffy's best and most punchiest assuming their place in the world with proper commander scale bounties. But rather hilariously, as it turns out, Zoro is worth almost exactly one Jinbei and one chopper, with 100 berries left over to spend, and look, with that 100 berries, you could buy two thirds of a One Piece cabbage. That's not even the bulk of the chapter though, because it mostly focused on the situation with Cross Guild, revealing some rather hilarious dynamics. Because as it turns out, and I can't believe this, but I gave Buggy far too much credit. Ironically, that is saying a lot, because I did not give him a lot to begin with. But as suspected, this whole endeavor really is Crocodile's mind, baby. No huge surprise there, he's the only one of these three capable of forming a successful enterprise, as this chapter goes on to emphasize actually, with Buggy's delivery being just a little bit broke. It's interesting because I always assumed that he found and used Captain John's treasure to fund Buggy's delivery, but he actually had to visit a lone croc to get things off the ground. I think my favorite part of this entire chapter is the short flashback of Buggy's henchman showing off his graphic design and going, oh Buggy Summer, I couldn't resist making you the most important clown man. And the whole situation is just fantastic. Buggy has basically bumbled his way into prominence in such a spectacular yet shameful fashion, and I just love it. In regards to Mr. Mihawk, I dare say that this is probably the biggest chapter he's had in terms of some character depth, particularly when Mr. Sir Crocodile courted Mihawk by hinting at a potential past betrayal and some ongoing trust issues with society at large. I mean, it's only two panels. You've got Mihawk looking serious in the flat flashback like this, <clears throat> and then you've got Mihawk looking serious in the present time like this. <clears throat> But there, there is a story happening here. We don't know what the story is, but in Mihawk's mind, there is some trauma resurfacing. Meanwhile, we also have the revelation of his epithet being Marine Hunter Dracul Mihawk, a very direct parallel to our own pirate hunter, Roano Zoro. But also Mihawk's crowning motivation has come forward and it's actually quite simple. He just wants to chill and live peacefully. And you know, and fair enough. He's already accomplished his life's goal of becoming the best guy ever. So now he just wants to be left alone. Hence why he became a warlord of the sea, because that ensures that neither the marines nor pirates are going to want to disturb him. And getting involved in Cross Guild also serves that purpose. I mean, yeah, it's a little bit more effort, but going after an organization is always less appealing than going after an individual. In any case, the world government have thoroughly, and I mean thoroughly, screwed themselves over with this whole warlord business, because without ending that system, Crocodile's whole endeavor would have been worth about as much as flaccid genitals, because Crocodile simply would not have been able to pull it off. The most exciting part though, is that our numbers are not over. Mihawk's bounty is 3 billion and 590 million berries, which currently makes him worth more than three out of four of our emperors of the sea. And even with Shanks, he is not that far off, roughly one Usopp's difference between them. I'm very curious though, because this is clearly a new bounty, and I'd be keen to find out what that number was before it was frozen. But I think this says a pretty phenomenal amount of what the world government think about Mihawk. He may be single, but according to the world government, he is more than ready to mingle. Judging this one sword boy, to 
be more of a threat than Luffy, who commands an entire grand fleet, consisting of giants, anti-giants, and urinating roosters. I know that bounties should not be used to power scale, but in Mihawk's case, I do actually think a bit differently. With bounties, they generally take influence into consideration, like how every emperor essentially has their own private army and countries and intelligence networks and all of the stuff. But Mihawk has nothing but his own individual power. Well, that and monkeys, which were in the chapter, by the way, you could see them like peeking through the window in the flashback, it was very cute. But look, even taking the monkeys into consideration, Mihawk's valuation here is based pretty much on raw individual power because he just has nothing else to offer. To contrast, this crocodile's bounty has been raised to 1 billion 965 million berries, which before Wano would have put him in the top 10 bounties just ever in the series. But we're at a point now where almost 2 billion berries actually seems a bit low and even a bit scrubby. But Crocodile's value was stated to be assigned mostly for intelligence and the fact that he has a Logia power. So he's a very smart Sandy Manny, probably very annoyed as well because Buggy's bounty is 3 billion 189 million, which is actually all thanks to Buggy's graphic designer. If he wasn't prominent within that poster, then Crocodile would probably be the one worth 3 billion red. But part of me really, and I mean really loves that Buggy has a higher bounty than Luffy. For the first time since Luffy's bounty was zero, that is, and I kind of hope we end the series with Buggy still having a higher bounty, somehow. I'm a bit surprised that it isn't higher than Mihawks, to be honest, because from the Marine perspective, Buggy looks like more of a threat to me, especially someone who can now command the world's greatest swordsman. I don't know, bounties are a bit weird sometimes. Like you would think that Zoro and Sanji beating King and Queen would naturally result in numbers that are at least on that similar sort of level. Same with Luffy beating Kaido, actually. But alas, Commodore Branyu has spoken, and in his infinite wisdom, which is lacking very integral knowledge, these are the numbers that we have landed on. Just as a side note, I think that Brand New might be one of my favorite characters in all of One Piece, because he only appears to announce big bounty news. So Old Mate here is kind of like a narrative pinata because every chapter he's in is a hit. And then we have the Revolutionary Army. Our commanders have returned to the Kambaka Queendom, although there is a distinct lack of Sabo. It would seem that during all of the Reverie-fueled chaos, they got separated from Sabo, and so they don't actually know the truth of what happened, much like us, really. This question of whether Sabo kill murdered Cobra has been lingering so long that I'm starting to second guess my original reaction. It just doesn't seem like an Oda move to entrench a protagonist in something so dark and bloodsome. In One Piece, good guys are good guys and bad guys are bad guys. Sometimes the bad guys are good guys, but the good guys are never bad guys. Unless they were bad guys to begin with, that's the exception, like Kondro or CP9. But seeing Dragon's serious face in 1058 did exactly what it needed to, which was plant some serious doubt seeds in the poorly maintained garden that is my mind brain. Dragon practically raised Sabo. And yet of everyone here, he is the only one seriously considering whether or not Sabo actually did it. Again, I don't want to read too deeply into this path because I still can't quite see it happening. But if Dragon thinks that maybe it might have, then it's knocked my confidence down from 100% to somewhere like say 95%. And of course the chapter ends on this cold cliffhanger, promising that we will discover the Sabo based truth in 1059, although that may not be the case. Oda loves to do this thing where he ends on a cliffhanger and then completely switches focus in the next chapter. Let me know in the comments though, do you think Sabo killed Cobra? Accidentally or no? The other piece of big news is Bartholomew Kuma being sighted free for the first time post time skip. And shockingly well dressed, mind you, which makes me wonder, did the Revolutionary Army just hold on to Kuma's clothes for the last two years? When Baltigo was attacked, did Dragon order his troops to make sure that all of Kuma's outfits made it to Momo Iro Island? And also who dressed him? He's like a mindless cyborg, he will need help. And my guess there is the Okama. Ivankov and his legion were quite skilled fabric smiths, even in Impal Down, so I imagine that they replicated his outfit. Enough of the big questions though, let's examine the small stuff. Like is Bartholomew Kuma actually still alive? Because it's entirely possible that all Sabo and friends of Sabo did was rescue and dress up a robot. You know one thing that should immediately answer that question though? Seeing his hands. If Kuma were no longer alive, then surely his devil fruit abilities would have reincarnated. But if those paws are still there, then on some level, so is Kuma. Unless the magical fruit powers got a little bit confused and didn't notice the passing of their user. There's also something interesting about Kuma's response to Dragon, you know, the whole robotic give me an order master and stuff. Because I wonder if he was given general programming to respond like that to literally anyone, or if it was specifically designed to respond to the world nobles, and this might say something very interesting about this dragon fellow. That's a question for another time, but here is a video for now. It's really good and such, and I look forward to seeing you there.